thank you very much for the organizers to invite me here to moderate this interesting uh, event, uh, very interesting topic. I have to admit that I'm, I only have very limited knowledge on, uh, on the topic. Uh, the only thing I did was I worked on a project um, which was led by the European Civility Initiative in Europe, uh, where we were looking at the EU's membership perspective or Turkey's EU membership perspective and how that is debated in different European uh, member states. And I looked here on the debate on Belgium. Um, that was quite interesting. We, so we were looking at different like uh, member states that were really skeptical towards, um, towards membership of Turkey in the European Union. Um, and this debate about uh, what happens to Turkey in the next years uh, when it comes to the uh, EU uh, has just reappeared lately. I don't know if you have followed that, um, but there were just a few, I think a week ago, the EU Commissioner for Energy, Günther Oettinger, just made a comment that in some years' time, French and German um, officials will, um, will crawl on their knees in order to beg Turkey to join the European <coughs> Union, which was uh, kind of irritating for many people in, in Germany, but also many other European states. And of course, uh, Barroso said uh, this is only like his personal um, position on this matter. And also Angela Merkel, she visited Turkey, I think two days later, and she also said that uh, this is just his personal uh, opinion. My opinion is still I am uh, very much in favor of a privileged partnership between Turkey and the EU in the, in the future. So, uh, but this kind of comments uh, brought like, the membership perspective of, of Turkey back into the um, spotlight in, in, the, in the European media. Um, there is some change maybe when it comes to, um, as you know, like the um, negotiations on EU membership uh, with Turkey are stagnating for some years. There might be some change in that because uh, the French president François Hollande has just announced a few weeks ago that uh, the, the French will rethink about their position on Turkey in the next years. But um, so far the negotiations are still stagnating. But in the meantime Turkey has uh, yeah, achieved quite a lot of progress, uh, especially when it comes to economic terms. <coughs> um, of course, there are many uh, still uh, difficult issues um, when it comes to reforms. Um, but Turkey has also strengthened its ties to the, the Arab neighborhood um, and also to its other neighbors, uh, neighboring states, including the Caucasus. And uh, this is the topic today. So I'm very uh, much looking forward to hear uh, about this uh, from the speaker. Um, Svante Cornell. Um, just about the schedule, the talk will be around 20-30 minutes. Uh, that will be followed by a short response by myself and then hopefully there will be enough time for a good um, discussion here with the audience, the questions and answers part. Uh, that will be followed by a lunch reception around 1.15 as far as I understand. Um, yeah, let me introduce you to Dr. Swante Cornell. He is uh, yeah, one of the experts here uh, when it comes to Turkey, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. I think you've also worked a little bit on the Middle East. Very little. Yeah. Um, um, Dr. Cornell has studied at the Middle East Technical University in Ankara, a very well-known university, and then he received his PhD from Uppsala University. Uh, nowadays he works as the director for the Central Asia Caucasus Institute and in Silk Road Studies Program at SAIS at Johns Hopkins University and the Stockholm-based Institute for Security and Development Policy. Uh, in this function he is also the m editor of uh, the journal Central Asia Caucasus Analyst and Turkey Analyst. And here in Washington he is also working as a professor at SAIS uh, teaching on Turkey and um, the Turkic world, that is uh, Central Asia. Um, and he has also been the author of many books, several books, and academic articles. Um, he's published in well-known journals, international journals. Um, he's written many policy papers. Um, and his most recent book is Azerbaijan Since Independence, which was published in 2011. So he's really the expert on the topic, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to hear his insights into um, yeah, the challenges in the, in the Caucasus, uh, and especially to Turkish foreign policy in the region. Um, yeah, the floor is yours. 
thank you very much for uh, for your kind introduction and for uh, the Rumi Forum for inviting me to speak here. Um, uh, the uh, perhaps this is a, an issue that is not at the top of the news, given that. For obvious reasons, Turkey uh, is now mostly focused with what's going on in its southern rather than its eastern border. Uh, but this is also one of the problems for the region that I work with, Central Asia and the Caucasus, is always, you know, somewhere on the list of priorities for all the major powers, but very rarely at the top. There's always something else that is more, uh, more acute, if you will. Uh, not always, but most of the time. Uh, but I think. Um, uh, I think both for Turkey and, and the United States, it's, uh, I, 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 I have the sense that perhaps five to ten years ago there was more of a clear understanding of why this region mattered as a region. And uh, from a Turkish <coughs> perspective, I think there are some issues that are similar to why it matters for the US and Europe. Others are a little bit different. Uh, of course, uh, just like for the West, uh, the South Caucasus is the gateway to the Caspian Sea and to Central Asia. It's really, if you think of the East-West corridor as the, the, um, the ability for both Turkey and for other Western powers to have a presence in, uh, in the inner part of Asia, if you will, uh, this is your corridor into that region. This is the bottleneck, if you will. Um, Turkey, of course, in terms of logistics and trade and even energy, to some extent can utilize the corridor through Iran to get to Central Asia, but it's really not quite as uh, useful as a direct corridor through the South Caucasus. There is also, I mean, Turkey is much closer to the region than uh, other Western powers. And there you have the, the threats uh, of the unresolved conflicts in the region that uh, have tr threatened to spill over on many occasions and that provide a factor of insecurity for Turkey. This was most obvious in the early 90s, of course, when the conflicts between Armenia and Azerbaijan and in Georgia raged. But if you go back to 2008 and the Russian invasion of Georgia, it was very much a shock for, for Turkey just as much as it was for, for anybody else. Uh, and I, I'd say that today the uh, growing tensions between Armenia and Azerbaijan again form a real, uh, I think, underestimated threat to m to everybody's interests in this region. Now, of course, for Turkey, there is also another factor, which is the cultural, linguistic uh, ling linkages with the region, especially, mm -hmm. of course, with Azerbaijan. Uh, the languages are not identical, but very, very similar, quite mutually understandable one to the other. Uh, so much so that it's led to this uh, official kind of talk about one nation and two states. Uh, being mentioned by leaders of the two countries almost like a mantra. Um, there are also, however, deep cultural connections to, to Georgia. Uh, I, I should mention that Turkey's prime minister is ethnically partly Georgian. Uh, so are many other of Turkey's uh, former interior minister Mehmet Ar, for example. You also have uh, high cabinet members who have North Caucasian descent uh, from Chechnya and other places. So there are powerful interest groups in Turkey with a Caucasian connection. And then, of course, with Armenia, you all know of the, the, the particular historical relationship between Turkey and Armenia, which is much more antagonistic and uh, tragic in many ways, of course, um, <coughs> and has a dynamic of its own. But before going to the actual agendas and, and interest and challenges Turkey have, I'd like to say a few words about how different Turkish political forces relate to the Caucasus, because they relate very differently. Um, if you take, for example, uh, the urban secular elites represented by the CHP, the Republican People's Party, um, they see they're not particularly interested in this region. They are very focused on Turkey's European identity. Um, they have a tendency to view the Turkic populations to the east as being less developed, if you will, almost more primitive than themselves, like the cousins from the countryside. Uh, they don't feel a cultural affinity, really, with the populations of, of Central Asia and the Caucasus. Although they, to some extent, value the, the official secularism that is being, uh, that is, re that reigns in these countries. Um, they are also heavily suspicious of any both Armenian state and diaspora agenda uh, and as how that relates to Turkey. Now, if you move to the uh, nationalist groups represented in parliament by the Nationalist Movement Party, the MHP, uh, they see, on the other hand, this region as a core interest, but purely on the basis of these ethnic and cultural and linguistic connections. Uh, they emphasize very much Azerbaijan and the Turkic countries of Central Asia. Uh, they are really not very, they don't really know how to deal with Georgia. Um, because they don't have the very same level of affinity. And of course, they are viscerally uh, uh, suspicious and antagonistic towards Armenia. Um, 
A third group is the Islamic conservatives, uh, who also have much like kind of a mirror image of the secularists. They're not particularly interested in this region either, since their main identity is religious rather than ethnic. They feel much closer of an affinity to the Middle East than to uh, many of the Turkic populations in Central Asia. Uh, some of them even view these as, you know, corrupt Muslims in a way that are vodka <coughs> drinking and corrupted by Russian culture, if you will. Um, uh, it should be said, however, that the Islamic conservative movement has much less of a suspicion towards Armenia, for example. And if you look at Armenia, they prefer, in many ways, the Isla a Turkey that would be led by Islamic conservatives to a Turkey that would be led by Kemalists. Now, a fourth group is a, what used to be known as the center-right in Turkey, the political movement of people like Suleyman Demirel and uh, Turgut Azal. Uh, they have a sympathetic approach to the Turkic states. They have a certain motivation of Turkish nationalism, much lighter than the MHP, of course. And they are, but they are have much more pragmatic in looking at the Turkish interests in the region. Uh, and it's no coincidence that it was Suleyman Demirel in particular who put Turkish policy uh, towards the region on a very firm footing in the 1990s after what had been a quite early cultural and ethnically focused approach in the early 1990s. Um, and that implied, for example, a very strong embrace of Georgia. Because, you know, if you look at a map, Turkey is separated from the Turkic world, the rest of the Turkey will buy Armenia and Georgia. And given the antag antagonistic relations with Armenia, there was a need to, so to speak, develop a corridor. Without Georgia, you don't have a corridor. Uh, the center-right forces were able to do that. Now, if you, uh, outside of politics, since we're here today, I think the, the Hizmet movement, which is quite uh, influential in Turkey, shares, if you will, the center-right approach, rather than the Islamic conservative approach to this region, I would argue. Uh, a pragmatic and strategic approach that is also informed by a certain sense of, uh, of, uh, of a common Turkic identity. But it is, uh, it is not, if you will, the ethnic nationalism of the MHP, far from it. What does this mean in politics? Now, the AKP, of course, is an amalgamation of many of these different forces. And I would say, in principle, that the AKP combines, if you will, the Islamic conservative perspective with the center-right perspective. De depending on who in the AKP government you talk about, you will find either uh, the Islamic conservative uh, perspective, where really this region is secondary to the Middle East. Uh, but among many of the representatives of, of the party, you will find a sort of uh, center-right-like focus uh, quite on this region. Now, if you look at how Turkey relates to the very different countries of the South Caucasus, who of course have different, speak different languages uh, and belong to different religious families and have very complex relations with one another, um, if you look at it from a purely strategic point of view and try to prioritize, I think there is, there is no question for Turkey that the, the paramount country in the region is Azerbaijan. Uh, and it is so for reasons entirely separate from the ethnic and cultural linkages, actually. It is, the uh, strategically speaking, the only country that both borders Iran and Russia. Therefore, if you talk about a bottleneck through the Caucasus into Central Asia, Azerbaijan is that bottleneck. Uh, economically speaking, Azerbaijan, thanks to its oil and gas industry, now has an economy that is larger than Georgia and Armenia combined. Um, as an energy producer, it's very important both to Turkey's own improved diversification of energy sources, but also to its ambitions to become an energy hub for Europe. That link goes through the connection through Georgia and Azerbaijan into Central Asia. If you add to that fact the, uh, the very deep public solidarity that uh, Turkish public opinion feels towards the Azerbaijani cause, as especially in its, in its uh, uh, conflict with Armenia, uh, I think there is no surprise that Turkish policy <coughs> is and must be guided by the primacy of the importance that it accords to its interest in a, in a solid strategic partnership with Azerbaijan. As far as Georgia is concerned, uh, as I said, Azerbaijan is disconnected from Turkey. Uh, Turkey must access the rest of Azerbaijan either through Georgia or through Armenia. And given um, the, um, the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict, it's no surprise that Georgia has been, uh, if you will, the corridor that every major infrastructural and, and logistical uh, connection connecting Turkey with Azerbaijan has gone over Georgian territory. Um, 
so in that sense, Georgia, if you will, also has, it's not an ideal candidate for a strategic relationship with Turkey because traditionally, historically, Georgia has very strong anti-Turkish uh, sentiments that they have, so to speak, been trying to overcome in the past 20 years. And I think under both uh, President Shevardnadze, took the first step towards overcoming this historical hostility to Turkey uh, for pragmatic reasons to, to build uh, a, a very positive relationship. This was deepened under President Saakashvili after the Rose Revolution and I think it remains to be seen what the current leadership under Prime Minister Ivanishvili will do and I'll come back to this. Now finally on Armenia, uh, because of the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan because of the uh, uh, historical debates, if you will, and disagreements over what happened in 1915 mm -hmm. and because of the border issue between the two countries, this relationship has been quite bad from, from the beginning. Uh, and it's a problem for Turkey for a number of reasons. Uh, first, it's bad for the economy of Turkey's eastern, eastern provinces. It also links directly to the Armenian diasporas, especially diasporas, to some extent the Armenian state's uh, efforts to demand recognition of the mass murders of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire as, as genocide internationally. And it is a problem for Turkey in its relationship both with the United States and with Europe. Uh, Turkey would ideally like this, this to go away, but I wouldn't claim that this is an imperative from, from the perspective of Turkish national interests. Now, if, if we move to the current challenges, I'll really, uh, before concluding speak really only m about three. Uh, the first being the, the Turkish-Armenian relationship, the second being how to deal with the new government in Georgia, and the third, uh, we could briefly discuss if we have time, the energy projects for the future. Now of course everybody in, in the city is aware of, I think, uh, working on these issues to, uh, to the, uh, the issue of the Armenian-Turkish protocols of three years ago. Um, in 2009, uh, after strong urgings from the Obama administration and with the help of Swiss mediation, Turkey and Armenia embarked on, on an attempt to, to establish diplomatic relations, which have never been established between the two countries, and uh, also to open the common border that was closed by Turkey after the Armenian uh, occupation of Kelbajar province uh, west of Karabakh in Azerbaijan in 1993. And I would think, I would say that this Armenian rapprochement didn't begin in 2009. It began by connections between civil society groups and business people uh, several years before that. And it was also, it was in itself played an important role in, in the greater openness, in contributing to the greater openness with which Turkey is now approaching domestically its history and to the, the broader freedom with which people can speak about very controversial issues from the past, including uh, whether what happened in 1915 in the Ottoman Empire amounted to genocide or not. This is something that if you look today in Turkey, people are discussing it openly. When I lived in Turkey in the mid-90s, this was not the case. Um, and the, this process was supported very strongly by both the US and the European Union with several sets of logics. So first, it would help Turkey make up with its history, which was considered important in its own right. Uh, second, uh, in a deadlocked situation in the Caucasus, it would open one of the closed borders in the region, and therefore it would uh, potentially wrest Armenia away from Russian dominance. I think that was one of the logics. And the third logic was that it would make Armenia feel more safe and more secure, and therefore more willing to also make peace with Azerbaijan over the <coughs> conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, and that is, I think, the reason why the Obama administration here very strongly supported the idea of delinking the Turkish-Armenian relationship from the Armenian-Azerbaijani relationship, which the, the Turkish government had for 20 years been linking to one another very strongly. Now, if you take these arguments one by one, I would argue that they have very different uh, merit. Uh, the first one, I think, is entirely correct. As I already mentioned, uh, the increasing dialogues between <coughs> Turkish and Armenian groups helped Turkey very much uh, provide a, a more open debate about its own past, uh, which is also very relevant for the present. And the, the second aspect, the idea that a Turkish-Armenian deal would a reduced Russian influence in the region um, is more doubtful. To begin with, it, it would be difficult to explain why Russia was supportive of the protocols, if that was indeed the case, since apparently this would go against Russian interests. Um, whether they did really support them is another issue. We could get back to that perhaps in the question and answers. 
Uh, but I think in reality, Russia on the one hand felt that it has such a dominant control over Armenia through military bases, ownership of key assets in the Armenian economy, and so on, that it could <coughs> afford this. And secondly, that Russia saw in these protocols a key opportunity to disturb Azerbaijan's Western orientation. And I would add that this did not occur in a vacuum, of course. It was a year after the war in Georgia, where Russia had declared a sphere of privileged interest in the former Soviet Union and beyond. Uh, it had brought Georgia to its knees, after which it offered to take the lead to broker a peaceful solution to the Azerbaijani-Armenian conflict. You may ask, with what credibility? Unfortunately, that question was not asked in Washington, it was not asked in Europe. People said, sure, yeah, go ahead, uh, no problem. Uh, and that left Azerbaijan feeling very isolated, uh, noting the West's unwillingness, as they perceived it, to support Georgia, and really accepting a Russian free reign in the Caucasus. Uh, so while Russia, on the one hand, supported the Armenian-Turkish protocols, it was rapidly enticing Azerbaijan to, so to speak, abandon its pro-Western orientation, to sell all its gas to uh, to uh, Russia instead of to the West, and as it was put, to have a more constructive attitude towards its position on the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict. So I think the pre premise on the, of the second assumption was highly questionable at best. Now, uh, more importantly, the third assumption, I think, is the weakest one, namely that a Turkish-Armenian deal would support the idea of, uh, or benefit, a solution to the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict. This logic might have worked in countries like, say, Denmark. If I feel more secure, I will be nicer, right? Uh, but in the Caucasus, I think we are far from this logic. Um, now, assume that Armenia's main strategic problem, its closed border with Turkey and the fact that it doesn't have relations with one of the most important powerful states in the region, growing powers, if that problem is resolved, would that either make Armenia more eager to give up what they consider the first military victory in a thousand years, or would it make them feel empowered to consolidate their military victory and able to live with a situation in which they have control over Nagorno-Karabakh, although it is not recognized by the rest of the world? Uh, in my mind, I think uh, the answer is fairly obvious, that it was much more likely that the second option would be the chosen policy than the first. And therefore, I think the idea of uh, the Turkish-Armenian rapprochement being beneficial for the solution to the Ar armenian azerbaijani conflict was wrong. Not only was it wrong, I would say it was outright dangerous, uh, because it hastened what we're seeing now, the escalation, what is really an escalation to a new war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Because this is not a frozen conflict. Uh, in the last 20 years, after Armenia won the war, uh, expelled uh, 800,000 Azerbaijanis from their home in the occupied territories of Azerbaijan, um, there has been uh, a growing imbalance between the two forces. The country that won the war has a smaller population uh, as a result of emigration, as well as a much weaker economy, whereas the country that lost the war, Azerbaijan, has now an economy that is four or five times larger than Armenia's, and a defense budget that is larger than Armenia's entire state budget. In this context, uh, I think if you look at it, from the Western perspective, after the war in Georgia, the lesson should have been, we messed up one conflict, we, we could not, we did not, we failed to stop its escalation into a new war. Let's get the other one right. But that was not the policy option chosen by the Western uh, governments, nor the US, neither the US nor Europe. The idea was let's shove it even deeper into the back burner and focus on what is really a much lesser, a less acute problem in the region. And therefore, I think what we're seeing uh, since then is, in fact, that the Azerbaijani government was effectively told, um, you have two options, you know, either accept that your main priority is not our main priority, or escalate the conflict. And Azerbaijan decided that it was not willing or able to accept that the resolution to the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict was on a lower list of priorities. If it is on a lower list of priorities, you have to bring it up the list. How do you do that? I'll leave it to you to answer that question. So I think the, uh, unfortunately, it was a missed opportunity of utilizing the focus on the region that resulted from the war in Georgia to achieve uh, progress towards a solution. My conclusion is that the Turkish-Armenian relationship cannot be removed or disconnected from its regional realities. Uh, 
it remains, I think, an important part of a solution to the region's problems, but it has to be linked. The linkages cannot, you cannot dream away the linkage between the Turkish-Armenian relationship and the Armenian-Azerbaijani relationship. It's going to be there, and it's going to have to be resolved in tandem with one another. I think Turkey's other big challenge in the region is, um, uh, is the what is going on in Georgia. And here, uh, I, as I said, there is a contentious common history, but also 20 years of a building of a strategic partnership that, in, if you will, proved wrong the theory of the clash of civilizations. Uh, the booming of business, political, cultural linkages between Turkey and Georgia is an example that in this part of the world it is state interest and not cultural identities that determine, uh, that determine policy. If you fly into the airport in Batumi, for example, you will find that this airport, which is in Georgia, is also a domestic Turkish airport. Uh, because it's so close to the Turkish border, uh, passengers who are domestic Turkish passengers are put on a bus and driven across. They don't have to go to passport control in Georgia, they're just driven across the border. And you find many examples of this. But I would argue that the new Georgian government that succeeded uh, Saakashvili's government is, poses challenges because it's a very eclectic combination of, on the one hand, uh, pro-European forces that well understand the importance of Turkey for Georgia, but it also includes ethno-religious nationalists in Georgia that are um, motivated what I, by what is quite strongly anti-Turkish and anti-Muslim sentiments. Uh, and in, to understand this, I think it's important to understand the religious revival that has taken place in Georgia and which has been much stronger than either in Armenia or Azerbaijan. You find today um, that the or Georgian Orthodox Church ha has made a very forceful uh, comeback into Georgian society, um, which is an understandable phenomenon that you can see across the post-Soviet space. But it is also, the problem is really that the Georgian Orthodox Church today is dominated by very intolerant and in fact xenophobic forces. And this is not solely directed against Muslims or Turks. It's directed equally against Armenians and against Catholics. You can see this in the way that the, uh, much of the Georgian opposition uh, uh, condemned the Prime Minister of Georgia uh, in the late, late last year, Vano Merabishvili, on the basis that he was a Catholic, and he is a Catholic. Uh, you find examples like the um, second highest ranking cleric in the Georgian Orthodox Church publicly on television saying that Catholics should be killed. Uh, simple as that. Uh, this is the environment that at least in very influential r circles within the Georgian Orthodox Church are having a very profound impact on parts of society and parts of politics. Just an example, the, um, the, uh, the church forced uh, the otherwise quite moderate patriarch of the Georgian Church to leave the World Council of Ch Churches in 1996, of which he had himself been a past president. It prevented Georgia from signing a treaty with the Vatican in 1999. Uh, and uh, it has been, the church has also prevented um, uh, various Christian groups and Muslims from building places of worship, for example. Um, and when Saakashvili tried to control the church, among other by last or two years ago, uh, providing a legal status for the Ar Armenian church in Georgia, there was a visceral anti-Armenian and anti-government reaction by the church and the political groups that supported the church and which are now part of the current government. Um, if you look at the electoral campaign, you find that on a local level, quite significant forces within this Georgian Dream Coalition uh, had, were openly calling um, Saakashvili an un-Georgian and Armenian, uh, as if that was something that would disqualify him from his political position. Uh, it was also decrying the right of Muslims to build a mosque in, in Batumi, for example, which is uh, a largely Ajara, where Batumi is located, is, uh, has a strong Muslim population. Uh, the argument was that Turks were buying Ajara and that Georgia should not allow this to happen, and so forth. So what you're seeing is right now a kind of a struggle for influence over the Prime Minister by the pro-Western, pro-European, pro-democratic forces within the coalition. And on the other hand, the, these strong xenophobic anti-Muslim forces, uh, anti-Turkish forces that are also quite influential. And this is certainly something that I think Turkey needs to watch because at the end of the day, this threatens to undermine what has been one of the pillars of the stability of the East-West Corridor that Turkey and the West have been trying to build over the past uh, 20 years. Part of the story is also that the Azerbaijani-Georgian relationship has been somewhat rocky for similar reasons. 
Now, finally, I think uh, I won't spend too much on energy because we don't have, or too much time, I don't have too much money to spend on energy, uh, but because we don't have time for that. But um, uh, what really, I think, you know, has happened over the past 15 years is the establishment of the export routes for Western Caspian energy. First, the baku jehan pipeline, uh, and secondly, the, uh, now the, the signing of the Trans-Anatolian pipeline project between Turkey and Azerbaijan. What remains to be done is the securing the export of the East Caspian resources, uh, which is still in its infancy, if you will, uh, with Turkmen and Kazakh resources looking for ways to get to market. And I think uh, Turkey is in a very strong position to make a push for this issue. Now, uh, to conclude, I think my assessment would be that Turkey has yet to operate according to its full potential in the South Caucasus. Now, this is understandable in many ways. If you look at the beginning of the AKP government, it was overshadowed by the Iraq issue, uh, to a secondary extent by the Cyprus issue and the relationship with the EU. There was maybe not time for the, this region. Right now, everything is overshadowed by the Middle East. And therefore, again, you don't have time for this. But I think important issues that where Turkish and American interests are very strongly aligned uh, exist in this region, which, uh, which are not fully um, mobilized, if you will. Uh, there was for some time a coordination of policy towards the Caucasus and Central Asia. That collapsed with the acrimony over the Iraq war. I think it's, there is much to be said for a dialogue over those issues to be reestablished. And I think uh, uh, that cannot only be a focus, the, the Turkish-American dialogue over this region cannot only and should not only be about whether Turkish-Armenian protocols are implemented or not. It has to be over a broader regional perspective about what are the interests of the U.S. and Turkey in this region and how can they be advanced uh, in parallel. Let me stop here and uh, we'd be glad to um, answer any questions or comments. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for providing us with a really deep analysis of the situation in the region and the relations between the states. Um, yeah, I, I use my, uh, the opportunity as moderator to ask you one or two questions on that. I found this, um, your assessment of the frozen conflict in the region really interesting. Um, there was this one thing you mentioned in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict that it has been um, at a lower list of priorities of the West in the last years, uh, which you kind of criticized. Uh, the resolution of the conflict has not been one of the priorities. Um, but what do you think, what kind of role could Turkey play in, this, in these kind of negotiations? I just read uh, a few days ago there are new negotiations in the OSCE Minsk group. Um, and Turkey has brought in, the Turkish government has brought in a new proposal um, that might be, it's about, as far as I understand, Armenia's participation in the Baku Tbilisi Cars Railway project. Uh, what do you think of that? Can Turkey bring an added value to this uh, conflict resolution format? And the second one is on the conflicts in Georgia. Um, here you also um, found this interesting, what you mentioned about Ajaria. Um, that there's fear in Georgia that Turkish buy into Ajaria. Is that a new conflict arising there uh, in Georgia? Uh, but on the other hand, can Turkey contribute to conflict resolution uh, to the frozen conflicts in, G um, in Georgia uh, and kind of sneak into the Geneva discussions that are currently going on? Well, on, on Turkey and in, in, in the Armenian Azerbaijani conflict, it's of course. You can look at it from different ways. I mean, one way of looking at it is, it is that Turkey's very close relationship with Azerbaijan makes it very difficult for Armenia to accept a stronger role of Turkey. On the other hand, of course, you might say that, well, uh, you know, Russia is one of the mediators in this conflict and it has even stronger military and political ties with, Ar with Armenia than Turkey does with Azerbaijan. So why not? And I think if you had that type of a, uh, that logic I think is quite compelling. But it would require that there is a clarity in what Turkey actually wants. And I think over the past years that has not been there. Um, because for a while you could even see within the Turkish government that there were forces that were very supportive of the Turkish-Armenian protocols, even at the expense of uh, letting down Azerbaijan. Um, but Prime Minister Erdogan himself intervened to, to basically stop that process. So there was no real clarity in the Turkish government about what are our strategic priorities in the region. And I think that was also seen very clearly 
uh, at the uh, Russian after the Russian invasion of Georgia, where Turkey immediately launched this what was first launched as a stability pact for the Caucasus. And then some people in the Turkish parliament and foreign ministry said, wait a minute, we're members of one pact, that's NATO. Uh, and then it was rapidly changed to a platform which became an initiative and which later died out. And I think I it shows that there has been a tendency in Turkish foreign policy of a reactive uh, and very ad hoc decision making, which is partly due to the fact that, you know, the very much of the p policy is made at the very top by the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister, not always in coordination with or benefiting from the full uh, from the full experience and skill of the Turkish Foreign Ministry. Uh, I think they could benefit better from the skill and experience of their diplomats. And in this case, it was very clear that the Foreign Ministry was not involved in this decision. It had not been consulted. It, it was done in a kind of a crisis mode. And it, for example, did not, the U.S. was not consulted. Uh, and it would envisage some kind of Turkish-Russian uh, Turkey as a junior partner to Russia in this kind of security environment in the Caucasus that was very reminiscent of the Turkish-Chinese relationship in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So everybody in the region said, you know, no, 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 we don't want this basically, or not in this shape and format. So I think Turkey has potential for a very, very positive role because, again, the if you sequence it right, uh, and you provide a positive incentive, the, the opening of the Turkish-Armenian border could be a, a positive, could play a positive role in the, in the resolution of the Turkish-Armenian-Azerbaijani -Azerba uh, conflict. But it, it is dependent on the Turkish government having made very clear for itself and for its partner what its strategic priorities are and how it's going to go about doing them. And I, I, at this point, I'm not sure if Turkey has quite that, the Turkish leadership has quite sat down for itself enough and, uh, and listed what its priorities are, how they relate to everything else. And inv invariably here you have the issue of Russia. Uh, three years ago, you know, Russia, Turkey was, had very positive ties with Russia. And that translated into being quite careful about the issue of Georgian NATO membership. As Turkish relations with Russia went sour over Syria, uh, my friends in Georgia are telling me that Turkey has become their greatest supporter in NATO again. So you see how there are, there are communicating vessels in the region and you have to somehow fix what your priorities in this region are compared to your relations with the Russians, the Iranians, the West and others. Uh, and if Turkey does this right, I think it has a tremendously positive role to play in both of the conflicts. In, in Georgia and Russian conflict, I think it's harder. Prior to 2008, Turkey was an ideal mediator because it was really a fair mediator between Turkey and Abkhazia. A strong Ab Abkhaz lobby in Turkey as well as very strong strategic relations with Georgia. Turkey would have been the only country really to be a fair uh, broker, an honest broker between the two parties. But now, with Russia having essentially annexed these two territories by recognizing their own appointed people as independent states, it's very difficult for anybody to intervene. And if, you, if you've ever heard a, an account of any of the Geneva discussions, I don't think anybody would want to join those discussions. Uh, they're <laughs> not very productive. So you, you, I hear that there's a kind of process going on at the moment of a new foreign policy concept uh, maybe on the Turkish side, changing a little bit from this kind of uh, zero problems with the neighbors in order to change a little bit, maybe getting more involved in conflict resolution and these kind of these kind of issues. One, one more question before we open to the, uh, to the audience. Uh, the internal situation in Georgia, uh, what do you expect here in the next month uh, coming? Uh, you have this kind of situation of cohabitation uh, between uh, Ivanishvili and uh, Saakashvili. Um, is, there, is there any chance that uh, there will be a peaceful transition uh, to a new government or how do you see that? Well, I mean, the peaceful transition has already taken place. Um, uh, it's been very con conflictual and very difficult, but I mean, uh, you know, you found something as rare in the former Soviet Union as an incumbent leader accepting defeat in an election. And to some extent, you know, initially the Saakashvili, pre President Saakashvili was quite cooperative. Uh, he could have maintained, according to the Constitution, control over the ministries of defense, interior, and um, I believe justice without consulting with the elected government, but he allowed the elected new government to appoint those positions as well. <laughs> uh, later on, things have gotten worse, partly because uh, of Saakashvili's continued efforts to uh, lobby against the new government in the West, but mainly, I would argue, because of the the new government's very uh, harsh or very, uh, how should I put it, uh, should we say, 
very activist use of ju the judiciary against former members of the Saakashvili government. Uh, the, the chief prosecutor of Georgia himself said, there are no persons in the former administration that are not on my list for questioning. Uh, and you know, you have several ministers, uh, a couple of dozen people already being detained and arrested. Some who probably deserve to be uh, questioned and arrested, uh, some of them who certainly do not. Uh, and I think it's becoming quite similar to the Ergenikon uh, situation in Turkey where you have uh, you know you have a very large group of people that is being targeted by the judiciary some of which probably deserve to be and others who don't and then you have the risk that by dilute that the the the, the achievement of justice is diluted and uh, in, a, in a way prevented by prosecutors having cast a net that is too large and therefore losing credibility even for the people for prosecuting the people that probably should be in jail that certainly hap I think that's happening in Georgia right now um, and where it will end I don't know but I know that in Europe already there are you know Georgia was on a very good track to to receive to sign an association agreement and begin and a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with the EU in the Vilnius summit of the Eastern partnership in at the end of this year if I had to bet any money, I would bet that that's not going to happen anymore. Basically on account of what is widely seen in Europe, uh, again, whether rightly or wrongly, as Georgia following the steps of Yanukovych in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be, uh, it's too early to, I think, to give a kind of a verdict. The government has been in power for three or four months. Uh, it's a very inexperienced, I mean, the Prime Minister has no prior political history. He's not a politician. He's a business tycoon, and uh, it, it might take him longer time to learn. But I, I don't think so far the signs are very encouraging. Hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, so you think like the European Union will link kind of judicial or the kind of uh, things happening at the moment in, 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 in Georgia to the signing of the... Oh, it has already been linked in the sense that European leaders have already publicly and especially privately stated to Mr. Ivanishvili that uh, Please do not make the mistakes that Ukraine made. And you saw what happened to Ukraine, their relationship with Europe was frozen. Mm -hmm. I think the, state, the, the message cannot be clearer than that. Thank you very much. I would like to use a chance uh, to <coughs> yeah, open the floor for the audience. We have here two questions. Maybe we start with you here. And with you, please identify yourself and uh, be as brief as possible. So thank you very much. This is Utu Kundakçı. I'm from the Turkish Embassy. Uh, since all the topic was particularly concerning Turkey, I have a lot of uh, comments, but I'm not going to do, do that. I'm not going to uh, just uh, make you to have this miserable uh, position. I'm just going to have some comments and then ask a few questions to Dr. Cornell. So uh, as you, you mentioned that this region, Caucasus region, is uh, a little bit on the background because of the international developments. That's true to a certain extent because all the international attention is <coughs> nowadays around the Middle East in Syria and Iraq. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Turkish foreign policy is not is not uh, focused on Caucasus as uh, as it, it would be as it should as it should do. So uh, in that sense, Turkish foreign policy, the Caucasus region, is a very important component of Turkish foreign policy. And in the Caucasus region. We basically uh, want to have peace, prosperity, and stability, and we do our utmost to make sure that the three countries in the region can have a regional cooperation, can have regional integration, and this would be beneficial for Turkey and other regional countries as well. So in that sense, it's not uh, at the background, it's an important topic in Turkish foreign policy, and that's why there are regular contacts with our Azerbaijani uh, partners, we have excellent relations uh, with Azerbaijan. We have a holistic approach towards the Caucasus region, and we want to establish good uh, cooperation with all the countries in the region. And as I said, we have excellent relations with Azerbaijan. And we also want to normalize our relations with Armenia. And uh, we are bound by the protocols that were signed in 2009. And uh, basically, we are committed to those protocols. But obviously, this commitment is not one-sided. The Armenian side is also committed to these protocols, but uh, we cannot see the uh, constructive approach we are showing in terms of protocols, in terms of normalization process from the Armenian side. So what we expect is more constructive steps, and uh, I'm sure if uh, necessary political, uh, political atmosphere will appear in the region, in the Caucasus, we will be able to normalize our relations. But that should be that should be some positive steps from the Armenian side as well in that sense. 
And uh, by the way, Turkey is, a, as, you may, uh, as you very well know, is a member of the Minsk group. And in that sense, is very much involved in the negotiation process. We are not a co-chair. We do not uh, compete with the co-chairs. They have a different, uh, they have a different you know, uh, responsibility. But Turkey is a member of Minsk group. And what we expect from the Minsk group and during this uh, negotiation process of the Nagorno-Karabakh problem is to, have, uh, to come up with more uh, plausible options and to make sure that uh, Minsk group will, can find a solution to this long-lasting problem. And uh, lastly, I can say some few words about Georgia. I was in Georgia, in Tbilisi, our embassy in Tbilisi, for two years before I was posted to Washington, D.C. And uh, uh, I'm sorry that you have a very pessimistic approach to what can happen between Turkish and uh, Georgian relations. Because uh, during those two years, I, I personally saw that Turkish-Georgian relations are not tactical. They are not uh, dependent on one or two leaders, but they are strategic. Although you may say that uh, Turkey and Georgia are not ideal strategic partners because of like cultural and religious differences, uh, that's not the case. What we have on the ground is not the, is not that case. As you mentioned, these two countries are sharing the same airport, but that's not the only thing. They are the citizens of both countries are traveling mm -hmm. from Turkey to Georgia with their ID cards, not even yep. passports. And in that sense, uh, I'm not that pessimistic. And two weeks ago, Mr. Vanishvili, the new leader, visited Turkey. And they had very fruitful uh, meetings with our president, mm -hmm. President Gül, Prime Minister Erdogan, with our uh, president of the parliament. And during all these uh, fruitful meetings and in public statements, both sides mentioned that the cooperation, close cooperation will continue between Turkey and uh, Georgia. And in that sense, I'm not that pessimistic. I think this cooperation will, uh, go, uh, will be more uh, successful in the future. And my question is, uh, as I said, we cannot we cannot only uh, ask for ask Turkey to do something about Turkish Armenian relations. So uh, Turkey is facing its history, as you mentioned, but I think Armenia should also face its history. That we cannot accept a one sided approach to this historical debate. And uh, do you see any possibility in Armenia that this historical question can be more uh, questioned by the Armenian side? And apart from that uh, there was a recent election in Armenia, and Mr. Sarkisian won the election, election process, elections again. And do you think there is any uh, possibility that Mr. Sarkisian, in his second term, will be more constructive, will have more power to uh, move forward with Turkish Armenian, Turkish Armenian uh, normalization as well as Nagorno-Karabakh process? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so one question on the uh, Armenian-Turkish relations. We have another question around here. Please be as brief as possible, and please, uh, yeah, ask your questions. Okay, thank you. Um, me too. Uh, my name is Armen Sahak, and I'm a research inst uh, uh, associate from the European Institute. Um, me too. Like, thank you very much for the presentation. I also have a lot of comments, but I guess I'll just uh, stay brief here. You mentioned CHP and MHP parties that they are very suspicious of the Armenians. Um, can you specify it a little bit more, like what are they especially suspicious of? Like, uh, because I hear this a lot, that you know, they're afraid of Armenia, the state, and the diaspora groups. Can you be more specific <coughs> in that regard? And how do you think, what do you think is the role of Iran in this? Because you, know, you mentioned Russia and Turkey. What could Iran, you know, do you see Iran's influence diminishing or increasing in the coming years? Mm. Thank you. Well, uh, to the gentleman from the embassy first, uh, thank you for your comments. Um, I would say under different uh, brackets, if you will. Georgia has tended to be viewed in, in the scope of Russian relations, Armenia with Turkey, and Azerbaijan with Afghanistan. And I think one of the reasons why the support for the protocols failed was because it was not, from the U.S. point of view, viewed in a holistic way. Uh, so that was not a criticism of Turkey as much as of the U.S. I think in Turkey there is more of a holistic view of the region. I think you're right. Uh, I think the, the mistake that Turkey made was the overt delinking of the Turkish-Armenian and the Armenian-Azerbaijani relationship. I remember the Undersecretary of the Embassy made this very clear in a statement at our institute in 2009. And I think that was, that was probably something that that has later I mean the Prime Minister later went back on that issue and reestablished the linkage but that that, that exactly that leads to your other to your question about possibilities in Armenia because I think in Armenia the understanding of what happened with the protocols is very different from the one in Turkey and what went wrong they saw Prime Minister Erdogan I mean in Turkey I know what the, the issue is very much related to the Armenian constitutional courts decision and so on but in Armenia, it's very much viewed, and perhaps the gentleman uh, who asked the second question would 
uh, agree or uh, or disagree I don't know but that the the problem was that Prime Minister Erdogan from their perspective is a problem is that he flew to Baku and basically re-established the policies that had been in place before the protocols were were put in place so therefore I think it's going to be difficult to uh, to see a, a change in the Armenian uh, position, especially with Armenia and Azerbaijan, I think increasingly now you're on the path is towards confrontation. As you see in the case of, for example, the Ar Azerbaijani decision to pardon uh, the convicted, uh, the murder, uh, the, con the officer who murdered an Armenian officer in, in Budapest, and, and the Armenian decision to open the, the airport in um, in Khojali, uh, the place where a massacre of Azerbaijanis took place in 1992. I mean, the, the, the cycle is in a different direction. And I think without strong international uh, mediation on a much higher level than today, you're not going to be able to stop this negative spiral. And the m problem of the Minsk group is that it's at the wrong level. I mean, to deal with a conflict that involves this level of geopolitical complexity, you have to have very senior mediators. People at the, if you will, the late Richard Holbrooks type of level of mediators. And in none of the country, I think there is nothing wrong, uh, per se, with the people who are the co-chairs of the Minsk Group. They are professional diplomats. But they are mid-level diplomats. They are not the, the star diplomats, if you will, that I think would be the, the top-level diplomats that have direct access to their respective political leaders. So if Turkey, I, I know Sweden is a member of the Minsk Group too, and I know what that means in practice, which is that the Minsk Group co-chairs sometimes share some information about their visits. You have to really pull it out of them uh, in order to get something out of them. They don't really share very much. The Minsk Group, the broader Minsk Group, is not that very much alive, but I think Turkey could very much use this position in, in terms of trying to effectuate a change to the Minsk group but because I think one is direly needed. On, on Turkish-Georgian relations, I am not necessarily pessimistic. I'm saying Turkey has to be very careful uh, because Mr. Ivanishvili is not a politician. Uh, he has some forces and the ones that traveled with him to Turkey like Defense Minister al Asani, are very positive, fully understand the importance of the Turkish relationship. But there are other people around him who have a totally different perspective. And it's going to be important to make sure that those forces that have a more negative attitude towards Turkey, uh, especially those forces that are unfortunately tied to the, or the Georgian Orthodox Church, do not end up having a strong influence over the Prime Minister and the decision-making in the country. That's a challenge for Turkey. Uh, it's one that can be overcome, but I think it's one that, uh, that the Turkish leaders need to be very much aware of. On the, the CHP and MHP issue, I think the, uh, the, the issue is part um, mental, if you will, and part, uh, and part factual. It's, it's a it's in a way, a, partly there's a total unwillingness to even discuss what happened in 1915 that is partly related to that they don't want to find out what the results actually are, I think. Um, another one is the fear that I think has been inculcated by previous governments in Turkey very much over decades that if we give one inch on this issue, first uh, there will be demands for compensation and second there will be territorial demands. And some of the diaspora groups uh, are actually keeping this fear alive uh, by, uh, if you remember, one of the diaspora groups here in D.C. was annotating the protocols and saying this is unacceptable because it would recognize the Turkish-Armenian border. That type of statements keep these type of fears alive among the, if you will, old-style Kemalist nationalist elements of the Turkish political, political system. Uh, but I think it's very much a vestige of, of a, a past view. And you know, if people, you know, they went to school and were, were told a certain thing, this is, this is the truth and everything else is a lie, which is perpetrated by Turkey's enemies uh, that tried to split the country in the Treaty of Sevres in 1920 and are still trying to split the country into pieces. This, is, uh, this may seem very conspiratorial to us, but I think in, in, in quite, you know, very senior influential people in, in Turkey, especially those affiliated with the CHP and the MHP, this is, this is completely accepted truth. There is no way you can convince them otherwise. I mean, I've sat through long, long meetings trying to explain to people why, that if, 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 if the United States really wanted to split up any country, it wouldn't, Turkey would probably not be the first one on their list. But it's impossible to explain this to some of these. Uh, otherwise, you know, quite, quite uh, educated, p accomplished professionals. It's this, this conspiracy, conspiratorial view 
uh, of the West and of the Armenian issue is, is, is quite, quite amazingly strong among some of these circles. I think it's much less so in the younger generation of politicians, but it, it remains a reality. Thank you very much. Further questions from the audience? Yeah, maybe. I'm Wood, and I'm from the office, International Office of the Mayor of D.C., and I wonder how you would view or evaluate uh, new Secretary of State John Kerry's influence in our foreign policy, given his past pro-Armenian and actually anti-Azerbaijan as he, I think, initiated the economic sanctions 907 against them. Well, yeah, it's, it's an excellent question, and I think uh, I might not be the best person to, to answer it. But you're right in the sense that uh, Senator Kerry was uh, the sponsor of the Section 907 in the U.S. Congress that prohibited government-to-government -government assistance to Azerbaijan, um, which, of course, was a very unfortunate piece of legislation in many ways, and which, by the way, has not been abolished. It's being yearly waived by the president uh, since 9-11, um, but it's still on the books. Um, and um, I don't know to what extent, you know, Senator Kerry and Secretary Kerry are probably two different political identities. Uh, he, it remained, I mean, if it had been Senator Dole, he, Senator Dole had a very strong personal connection to the Armenian diaspora, because, you know, the story of the doctor who saved his life and so on. Um, I'm not sure that Senator Kerry is, is personally, I don't know whether he is personally committed in that way, and whether he, you know, let me put it another way actually. If you think about it, uh, during the Bush administration you had very high officials who had past affiliations with Azerbaijan, Richard Armitage, Vice President Cheney, and many others who were in senior positions. And I think eventually that turned out to be a negative factor because these people were somehow constricted from exercising their friendship with Azerbaijan exactly because they had been portrayed as being pro-Azerbaijani. They were vulnerable to criticism on that account. So perhaps it may work the other way around even, you know, that Senator Kerry, because he must be very well aware of such a perception of being affiliated with Armenian groups, maybe will be very careful to make sure that that is not seen as being a factor motivating his, uh, his, his, his uh, functioning as a Secretary of State. Um, it's very difficult to say, but I, um, I, I think the best way to look would be to see uh, how concerned people in Baku are, and they don't seem to be overly concerned about this issue. They were much more worried about the prospect of Senator Menendez becoming chair of the, uh, of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and so on than they were with Senator Kerry. That may be an indicator. I'm not sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think we're running out of time a little bit. Uh, so I think this was a final remark. Uh, there's one thing happening ne next year, uh, the Olympic Games in Sochi, um, which might have some kind of implications for the, these kind of conflicts in the North Caucasus that we didn't speak about. But I'm very much looking forward to read your analysis on these kind of issues next year. I'm very sure there, there, will be, uh, there will be these kind of issues will be in the spotlight. Uh, thank you very much yeah, for, in, for providing us with these very interesting insights into the region. Um, yeah, and please join me and really thank you very much uh, for giving us the talk today. Thank you.